Good afternoon, Cloud Native community, and welcome back to beautiful and snowy Salt Lake City, Utah. My name is Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be joined by Rob Streche for a power-packed but super fun-packed series of days. You and I barely got to eat lunch. We have so many friends here. Yeah, this has been <laughs> really uh, crazy. I mean, I, again, you know, with over 50% being new, this being their first KubeCon. As no, they, I love that that's a thing every year, too. such a fantastic thing, and I think, again, why not? I mean, AI is so much being built out on top of Kubernetes, and people are here thirsting to understand how to do it better, as we've been seeing all day long today, so. They're thirsty for those thirsty. tools. Thirsty. They're, they're thirsty for those tools, Rob, I love yes. that. Speaking of tools and cool companies and AI, Nathan from Vulture is here with us. Nathan, thanks so much for coming to hang out. Thanks for having me. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know you got in at 2 a.m. last night. I can tell your energy is ready to rock. And, <laughs> I appreciate and that. And it's exciting. <laughs> well caffeinated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is We've got today. tools. Yes. We've got tools. <laughs> That's, right. That's, That's what, that what we're talking about in general. Vulture's been around for 10 years. So is Kubernetes. Pretty interesting parallels there. In case folks aren't familiar, because you're doing a lot right now, what is Vulture up to? Absolutely, uh, so I'd love to tell you a little bit about Vulture. So Vulture is the world's largest independently held cloud computing company. Um, what that means is that we offer uh, cloud CPU, cloud GPU, bare metal, um, and we do that in 32 global data centers around the world. Um, what that means wow, is that, Wow, yeah, that's a lot. It is a lot. So we, again, yeah, we've been in business for uh, over a decade, and that, you know, as you compare us to hyperscalers, you know, we have comparable footprints to some of the world's largest hyperscalers. Um, we've also been doing it, again, for 10 years, so we have a great operating history as well. Um, and so what that means, you know, practically speaking, for end users uh, is that we're able to uh, address about 90% of the world's population in under 40 milliseconds. Uh, and I think that that's really important for obviously your traditional you know, web application, CDN deployments, uh, but also you know, with the advent of uh, large language models and agentic AI, you know, being able to deliver your uh, AI models to your end customers in the country that they're in, I think is, is something that's really important. Yeah, I mean, we see that as being key to your point about agentic and as people look to small action models and large action models that, or collaboration of agents as it would be, it, it seems like Kubernetes is kind of built for that, especially when you get into things like inference and Absolutely. out towards the edge, like you're saying, near the people. Yep. Is that what you're seeing and how, how does Kubernetes play into that at Vulture? Yeah, that's such a, such a great question. I think that you know, as you look at, you know, there, we've seen multiple waves of the uh, evolution of, of kind of Gen AI and large language models. Uh, and I think that it's really exciting to see this next wave that's just about to kind of come upon us, which is agentic AI. And so, what does that mean? What that means is that you know, the first wave of large Large language models, obviously, from you know the, the companies who are doing foundational model training, um, you know the Open AIs, you know Google's Meta's, um, you know they're releasing these, uh, you know in some cases, in the case of uh, Meta Llama, the op these open source models, uh, and they've been trained on a kind of a generic data set. Um, and I think that a lot of enterprises today are trying to figure out the best way to incorporate that large language model into their business because they've heard a lot about it. They see, you know they, they hear all the buzz of Gen AI and large language models, but what does that really mean? How do I really unleash the capability of these models for my business? And that's really where agentic AI comes into place. Um, and so if you imagine, you know, I think that you know, some companies think that if they just strap on a large language model, <laughs> that, that suddenly they'll un unlock a lot. But really, what it comes down to is incorporating that large language model into things like IAM for permissioning, uh, internal service APIs for real-time customer data, uh, as well as you know, product documentation pricing, so that when you're interacting with a company's large language model, it's actually not just a generic, hello, I'm here, how can I help you? And you ask the first question, it doesn't know the answer. It's actually, been, it's actually empowered to make those questions, uh, to, to respond to those questions with actually insightful answers, but doing so also in a secure way. Uh, making sure that there's actually a permissions model that dry, that's underpinning that is super critical. Uh, and so the, the next evolution of this is going to be really exciting. Obviously, Kubernetes being the underlying kind of you know, platform that everyone deploys their models and, and applications on top of, obviously puts Kubernetes kind of in the perfect position to do that. Um, but I think that's really going to be exciting to see that next wave uh, of, of agentic AI and what we're going to see in the market. I think you're, you're spot on. I saw Salesforce actually this morning, Mark Bienoff was saying he wants a billion AI agents in the next year, which is, uh, which is definitely a benchmark, <laughs> but also an indicator, <laughs> an indicator of, of industry drive and progress, and, and there's obviously a lot there. Okay, I'm still a little bit gobsmacked by the 90% of the world's population in 40 milliseconds <laughs> data point that you dropped earlier, and I want to tie that together to what you were just talking about, which is security. How are you managing that at the scale that Vulture is? I mean, that's pretty impressive. You're doing things extraordinarily fast all around the world in yeah. 32 different data centers, which is no joke, quite frankly. Yeah. How are you doing that? 
So you know, look, there's a multi-layered approach to everything, right? And so it, there's not one, you know, uh, you know, one silver bullet to how you manage that at scale. Um, and it comes down to really kind of iteratively building out the platform over the course of the last decade. And so you know, some of the key things that we look at, you know, in terms of the, the, the security is making sure that we can actually deploy the services that we run in each of these data centers. And so uh, we, it's extraordinarily easy for us to turn up a, another data center pop. It's actually something that we can do hands off. And so if we were to open up uh, a new location, it's a matter of obviously defining the resource, putting that into our, our core databases and then ensuring that we have uh, all the systems in place. And then at that point, we've already done all of the automation. And so it gives us the ability to turn up, uh, you know, and in some cases we've turned on a dozen plus new data centers in a single year. Um, and you think about this, the, the, the scale and the speed and the automation and testing and validation that goes into that, um, it's, it's really extraordinary. And we have an, an extraordinary team uh, of, of engineers and systems administrators and, and really the entire company who rallies around uh, and is really energized and excited about being able to, to do that. Because it really puts us at a super uh, exciting differentiation around some of our other competitors who, you know, if you look at obviously the hyperscalers, they've been doing the same thing like we have. They're, they're in you know, uh, dozens of data centers around the world. Um, and then you compare that to some of maybe some of these like AI Neo clouds uh, who, who kind of have just come up and are figuring out you know, how to operate a cloud in today's, uh, <laughs> in today's environment. And it's difficult. It, it's actually really difficult to put thousands and tens of thousands of, of uh, servers inside of data centers and do that globally, uh, especially with the scarcity of power of the supply chain. You know, the, and, and obviously we lean on our supply chain partners, we lean on you know, the, the, the data center market and our operators to be able to do that, and, and it's, you know, the, the output is that we're actually able to do that and deliver that ultimately for our end customers and, and create a ton of value for them uh, in the process of doing so. Do, do you see that organizations are building out applications differently now that AI is part of it, and where they're looking to have, they've had maybe multi-layer uh, applications, but we, we, what we're seeing in the research that we do is they're not trying to put out there a chat bot necessarily or a, just a prompt. They're not trying to you know, compete against chat GPT or something, yeah. unless they are. But unless they are. Very, there's, a, <laughs> there's a few out there. But most organizations, to your point, I think it's 1% of the data in the world is, uh, well, corporate data is actually in LLMs at this point, and that yeah. might be by, by accident. Um, well, that's an interesting data point. Yeah, so it's yeah. 99%. Do you see organizations coming to you and they're saying, hey, we're refactoring this application to bring AI in as a piece of it, and how, how they want to be able to deploy that? Is that a big push within your data centers? 100%, absolutely. I think that that is you know, the, the key and, and um, you know, there, there's been, uh, within the IT community at large, within enterprises, there is a, a, a huge amount of emphasis in what is the responsible way to introduce these models to the organization. And I think that there's one thing to have a developer in a development environment play around with a large language model and saying, yeah, sure, that's fine. But the moment that you say, okay, we're going to actually put this into production, a lot of questions come up. And those questions really involve data governance, uh, privacy, security, uh, who's going to get access to that data? Because fundamentally what you're doing is you're exposing a programmatic interface to potentially your backend you know, OSS, BSS data to somebody on the other side of that chatbot. Is it being monitored? How do we uh, deal with data, potential data exfiltration? Those are all really, really serious concerns. And so it does involve uh, a, a re-architecture. In some cases, a re-architecture, and in some cases, uh, intentional architecture of that application. Uh, when doing it for the first time, saying, okay, this isn't like another regular web application because now these developers are saying, okay, yes, this is not just an application. It's going to need access to X, Y, Z. And it's like, okay, well, what, exp what, what interfaces are you exposing to the customer? Well, we don't really know. We'll, we'll have to see what questions get asked <laughs> just to see what data gets exposed. And that really triggers a lot of, I think, rightful questions around, okay, how are we actually securing our data, our trade secrets, our business data, our customer data? Um, and so I think there's been a lot of work recently in, in, in making sure that the applications are architected in a way that emphasizes privacy and security, which I think is, is critically important. I, I, I felt it actually as you were just saying that and thinking people being like, oh right, we don't actually have any idea what might come up when this happens, which is definitely an interesting juncture to navigate. One of the things I like about Vulture, and I've, I've watched you guys for a while, you compete with some of the biggest brands on the planet. We do. What do you wish folks who maybe don't know as much about you knew? Because you're playing in not just the big leagues, you're playing in the all-star game and crushing it. <laughs> so tell me a little more about the secret sauce there. 
You know, look, I think it comes down to operational efficiency and a, and a really rich operating history. You know, I think that there's been some notable examples of people who have either come into the cloud market or people who are in the cloud market trying to compete against, you know, some of the giants that we see in our industry, um, and, and they have failed. And, and you see, then you look at a company like Vulture and you say, why are we succeeding? Why are we growing so quickly? Why have, been, why have we been consistently growing over the course of the last decade? Um, and it really comes down to a, a relentless focus on operational efficiency, on the customer, uh, ensuring that we're delivering and deploying uh, uh, services and products that our customers want and need. It's a focus on fundamental cloud infrastructure, and I think that that really, you know, if you look at, if you survey everyone around here at, at KubeCon, you know, there's a lot of platform engineering teams, and then what's the prime remit of platform engineering teams? It's to consume fundamental cloud infrastructure, uh, and that could be in the form of cloud infrastructure from hyperscalers, it could be cloud infrastructure, you know, in, in on-prem environments, but consuming infrastructure and then exposing a programmatic uh, a way for their application developers to deploy their application onto that platform, and Kubernetes obviously is the de facto standard and, and the kind of the gold standard on, on how to do that. Um, and so I think that's that's really you know uh, ensuring you know that we focus that we're focused on fundamental cloud services. And you look at again some of the hyperscalers, you got 200 plus services. You know that was great for the first wave. You know cloud 1.0 when it was like okay the cloud is amazing. If there if there's a service uh, if they've built a service we will consume it. Uh, and you're looking at now with cloud uh, with with platform engineering teams, it's not focused on consuming every service. Service. It's focused on really consuming that you know, cloud VMs, bare metal in a lot of cases, and then running Kubernetes on top of that, and then offering Kubernetes to your internal application development teams. Maybe you're consuming load balancers, you're probably consuming storage, but there's a, there's a half a dozen fundamental cloud services that you as a platform engineering team are consuming, and then everything else is kind of skipped. And that, and that creates a huge opportunity for us at Vulture to be able to focus on the fundamentals and offer really, really, uh, like if you look, at, obviously we're integrated with, with cluster API, we're integrated, we have a cross uh, provider for, for Kubernetes deploying infrastructure on Vulture at scale. Um, and that's really a huge focus of emphasis for us is ensuring that platform engineering teams, we, I, I like to say that we are the, the, we are the cloud platform for platform engineering teams. And we have all of the tools, all of the APIs that really are focused on, on allowing platform engineering teams to consume cloud infrastructure uh, in a really easy to consume way. Because you have your own Kubernetes platform as well and you we maintain do. that and you work through that with everybody, but to your point, you have some core services Absolutely. that you offer up. What are some of the most popular, because to your point, having worked for one of those other hyperscalers, uh, I lost track when we went across 300 different services, <laughs> and like, oh people, my gosh, people, yeah. people want solutions, not services. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I think you guys are more focused in that direction. So what are yeah. some of the key services that you're offering out? Uh, you know, absolutely. A, a fun game to play is which logo does that correspond <laughs> to the service? And it's yeah. impossible when there's 200 plus, right? Yeah. Um, you know, but, but it's very simple. So, you know, for, for AdVulture, you know, we have the, the entry point for consuming infrastructure for platform engineering teams is the first question. And so, is someone consuming bare metal infrastructure, in which case we have a, a really robust set of bare metal capabilities. Um, are you consuming virtual machines? Obviously we have a, a, a virtual machine uh, uh, platform as well. Or are you actually consuming, we offer a managed Kubernetes engine. And so this is Kubernetes that runs on top of Vulture infrastructure that allows you to um, have workload portability from any other Kubernetes instance. Could be something that you grew homegrown and don't want to manage that anymore. Could be a Kubernetes engine at one of the hyperscalers uh, you know, that, that you want to migrate over to, to Vulture for either price or performance reasons. Um, and we consistently get feedback that um, the, the Kubernetes engine experience on Vulture is something that is uh, meets or exceeds expectations when compared to some of the hyperscalers and certainly you know, somebody trying to run it themselves. I, I, I love that you have your own engine. I'm curious, I've asked a couple really smart people and I'm going to put you into this category now, this question. Do you think that AI is accelerating the adoption of Kubernetes? Are you seeing that within your platform? 100%, um, we absolutely see that. I think that that goes back to the entry point of consumption. Um, you know, and I think that there's, it, it, there's an interesting intersection of uh, Kubernetes applications that run on top of Kubernetes and AI, and, I think, and, and, and specifically AI applications. And so I think it absolutely uh, increases the adoption of Kubernetes. Um, I also think that you know, the way that you expose the fundamental GPU technology to your pods is also a super important component of that. Ensuring that, and obviously with Vulture, I can't speak to anyone else, but certainly at Vulture, it's very easy. You know, we, we hook into the AMD operators, we hook into the NVIDIA operators to expose the GPUs to the, to the pods, and so accessing that technology through 
the, through Kubernetes is actually quite easy. And that, so, you know, instead of again having to make the choice, and again, this is also one of the really kind of competitive differentiators at Vulture is that with some of these, you know, uh, newer AI Neo clouds that kind of are, have a lot of GPUs and are trying to figure out how to turn that into a cloud, you know, they're typically located in a, you know, one or two locations and trying to figure out how to add storage and add load balancers and add other services around those GPUs that they have. You know, and then you look also at the, and, but obviously they have a lot of GPUs, so the price is, you know, quite, you know, quite, quite low. Then you look at the hyperscalers and they have the suite of cloud services in a lot of regions, um, but the price, you know, the, the price of performance on those GPUs is very difficult. And, and at Vulture, we have the best of both worlds. We have the, the, obviously the global reach of our platform, but also access to uh, a, large, uh, a large amount of GPU technology in those locations. And so that really creates a really interesting value proposition for, for customers uh, who, are, who are excited and want to adopt this and need access to that, um, but, don't, but are struggling to make that choice. Do I do it over here or do, it over, do it over here? At Vulture, you can do it at Vulture and get both the best of both worlds in the same place. How do you, how do you to the people who just are hearing about you guys, even though you've been around for quite some time. Yeah. What would you say to those people who are hardcore Kubernetes, they're sitting here walking around, they're doing PRs, they're involved in the community. How would you say that Vulture fits within the Kubernetes ecosystem? Great question. You know, so I would say that we support the Kubernetes ecosystem in, in many ways. Like I mentioned, we are, you know, we have uh, a cluster API support. We have a cross-plane provider. Uh, we have a managed Kubernetes engine, which isn't, you know, some homegrown thing that we cooked up in the back room. This is, you know, this is the the mainstream Kubernetes engine that we run. Um, again, like I said, people who come to uh, come to Vulture will express their, you know, uh, uh, excitement about our engine and how it, you know, how it performs. Um, and I would also say that having that run on top of our bare metal infrastructure creates uh, a performance that you're not going to get in some other places, uh, where you know if people provision like a thin VM or a single tenant hypervisor, there's a there's a penalty to that, right? And being able to run Kubernetes on top of bare metal uh, is is uh, you know customers are able to experience that value every day. And so you know we obviously are hugely supportive of the Kubernetes ecosystem. We've you know done a ton of investment in our cluster API and cross-plane uh, providers, um, and really excited to see kind of the adoption of that uh, in the form of people consuming our, our Kubernetes engine uh, as well. What an exciting time for you all, congratulations. Thank you. All right, last question for you, Nathan, because this has been a blast and I'm sure we're going to have you back. What do you hope to be able to say in London or Atlanta next year at the next KubeCons that you can't currently say today? We have a lot of exciting developments coming at Vulture. Um, and one of the things that I'm personally excited about is actually tomorrow we're going to announce the release of Vulture File Systems. Um, and what Vulture File Systems is, is that it's a, a read-write-many um, file system that will can get attached to um, your pods uh, wherever they are. And this is something that we've been working on for a long time. I'm really excited about it. Um, and that's going to really, uh, especially for AI workloads where people need need access to their data. Um, being able to offer a file system approach to pods is going to allow people to put their either training data or their inference data in a single location on a single volume, mount that to all of their uh, applications and then serve up their model or do their model training uh, inside of Kubernetes on top of the Vulture platform leveraging Vulture file systems. Uh, we have a, a lot of other exciting things in the works as well, but that's one thing that I'm personally excited about. I love that. Well, we'll have to have you back on the show to talk about all of those exciting things. Nathan, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Thank what you for a, having me. Yeah, what, a, what an exciting time for everyone at Vulture. Shout out to the whole team, yeah. too. Rob, always a joy. Always, always. <laughs> always, always. <clears throat> <laughs> and hopefully you're having a joy-filled day, wherever you might be. We're here in Salt Lake City, Utah. Day one of KubeCon coverage. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.